Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. I'd like to welcome you to The Long Road. I'm here with my guests. Patty Little, the city clerk in Keene. And um, we're going to talk about the presidential primary coming up. And <clears throat> before we go into talking about the primary, we recently had a municipal election. Mm -hmm. And there were certain things about the wards changing. Has that any effect on this coming election? No, that redistricting uh, question that was on the ballot did pass the voters, but those changes to ward lines don't go into effect until June 1 of 2012. And in fact, anyone who is going to be uh, impacted by any of these ward changes will get a postcard from my office advising them of their new polling location. And um, talking about polling locations, again, before we... Mm -hmm. um, down at um, 350, 380, or 410 Marlboro <laughs> Street, depending on where you go. At the at, adjacent to the King Police Department is the new Michael E. J. Blastos community room that is now the Ward One polling location. We have the Ward Two continues to be at the Parks and Recreation Department on Washington Street. Uh, Ward Three continues to be Fuller School on Elm Street. Ward Four is Simon School. And for this election, Ward 5 is the um, new Crossway Church, formerly called the Trinity Lutheran Church on Art Street. The, um, <clears throat> now that the, the presidential primary, as, as I was walking here, and I'm saying we're, this show will air Wednesday, but once this show airs, it's going to be less than three weeks before the Iowa caucus, which makes it less than four weeks to the New Hampshire primary. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> This year just seems, compared to last one, 2008, the one before that, 2004, this one just seems dead. We certainly aren't getting the level of interest from the candidates. In fact, uh, today the Romney uh, campaign folks were in the office uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to obtain the absentee mm -hmm. ballot list. Uh, and they indicated they're going to ask for one more run at it, and that's it. <laughs> Not like years before when they were in here to my office like every other day looking for who's gotten an absentee ballot, who's gotten an absentee ballot. So certainly not sort of the energy from the national candidates this year, at least in this, as far as my office is concerned, just not seeing it. When you're talking about the absentee ballots, who qualifies for an absentee ballot? Well, we, it, New Hampshire is, is not a what they call a no-fault absentee ballot state. You need to have a reason to ask for an absentee ballot. And that reason cannot be that you just don't feel like voting in person. You have to either be physically absent from town or physically unable to go to the polling place or because of religious observance cannot go to a polling place. So when you ask for an absentee ballot, one of the things that you are going to need to complete is an affidavit attesting to one of those um, conditions for your qualification. So what happens if you're, you're a nurse or a doctor or a fireman or a policeman and you're going to be at work all day? Can you apply for an absentee ballot or you just have to fi find a way to, to figure it, get, it, get the vote during that time frame? You know, uh, we're certainly not going to say you cannot make a statement that you qualify if your work hours overlap the, the polling hours. Uh, I certainly expect that that does happen. Know that there's always an opportunity for another voter of the ward to challenge an absentee ballot. That is a very public process. And so when they read your name out, you may well have a, a challenger in the, in the, at the polling location saying, hey, that guy's in Keene, they're at work, why aren't they here? So you always, always open yourself up for a challenge of an absentee ballot. The, um, <clears throat> when we're talking... We had, for example, up at the State House, voter ID. What are the requirements for someone to, to register in, in Keene? Because it seems like a lot of people are getting all kind of conflicted information. Sure. Well, we're trying to prove a few things when, when you do your voter registration. Uh, one is your domicile. Uh, the second is your citizenship. And the third is your identity, and along with your age. So there's various documents that can prove that. A driver's license with your keen address really does the ticket. It proves your identity, it proves your, your date of birth, um, uh, and it proves your domicile. 
we have taken the position in Keene, our checklist supervisors took the position many years ago that we will not ask for everyone to give us their birth certificate, that they are swearing that they are a U.S. citizen in the registration card and we are letting it go to that, to that level. If someone gave us an address that was not a, a, a U.S. Uh, territory or, or state, uh, there are uh, other types of documentation, uh, sort of the default would be a, an affidavit that swears that you are a U.S. citizen. We also have affidavits that if you can't prove your identity, you could swear an affidavit that you are who you say you are. So can I go and register to vote day of election this year? Yes, you can. We have same-day registration for all of our elections. Uh, again, they'll be looking for some identification and proof of domicile. Uh, but again, those affidavits, uh, both the, uh, if you have no identification, mm -hmm. if you have no uh, U.S. citizen uh, documentation or no domicile verification, there are affidavits that could be provided to you for all those instances. The um, big question that's coming up is college students. Mm -hmm. And you have one group of people saying it's a violation of the law for college students to vote where they domicile. Mm -hmm. and, but the Supreme Court has said, no, you can pick one or the other, but not both. That's correct. A U.S. Supreme Court the decision. The U.S. Supreme Court. That's correct. And, you know, uh, the really, in my <laughs> mind, there's other, other justification in the fact that the city of Keene has benefited from the college population in terms of our census numbers. That census numbers reflect those several thousand college students. That census number also drives our representation to Concord. So if we didn't <coughs> account for the college population, we would not have the benefit of our seven representatives to Concord. So to me, in my mind, you don't take the advantage of the co co population from the college and then not extend to them the benefit. If you take the college population out, We'd only rate about five and a half, um, so we'd we'd lose a full term. Right. Then we'd have to share a number six with another community. Yes, that's correct. So, so the college population, you're correct. They are the only sort of class of voter that has a choice. They can register in their hometown, whether it be another New Hampshire community or another a state in the United States, or they can claim their domicile, their dormitory domicile, as their place of voting. They have that choice. And so if I'm a college student and I'm 20 years old and I come in to say I want to register to vote in Keene, mm -hmm. is someone going to ask me if I'm already registered someplace else? We have a statewide database. Uh, so yes, at the point of registration, that is one of the standard questions that we will ask as we key in that registration into that statewide database. If you are registered in another New Hampshire community, it is going to flag us into that database. And then we'll have to look at those dates of birth and just sort of assess what's going on. Because you've got some people always talking about fraud, but mm -hmm. there's been a number of um, investigations over and over again. Right. And it doesn't seem to, to show up. It just doesn't seem fraud. You know what it, they usually come down to? It's a, a, a father and a son with identical ad, ad names. Oops. That's usually what it is. And <clears throat> when we go in and we, <clears throat> we go look at, for example, the presidential primary, in especially Keene, especially New Hampshire, you have Democrats, Republicans, and, mm -hmm. and all the independents. Um, <clears throat> When I was working with the primary, I was filling in for the one in, I think it was 2008, there was a number of individuals who came in and says, I'm a Republican, I want to vote in a Republican primary. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were said, no, you voted Democrat last mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And can you explain how, how that sure. goes? Uh, once you, uh, well, Obviously, we have two parties in the state. Yeah. We have the Republican and the Democrat. We do not have what's called the, the independent, independent Party. It's just uh, an undeclared party from our perspective. And we no longer have the Libertarian Party in the state. So for a party election, Republicans and Democrats, they at this point, they are locked into their party affiliation. That deadline was October 14th to change your party affiliation to either another party mm -hmm. or go to undeclared. So on election day, on January 10th, a Republican who walks into the polling place will only be able to receive that Republican ballot, likewise a Democrat. 
if you walk into the polling places undeclared on election day, you have the choice. You can ask for the Republican or the Democratic ballot, knowing that whatever ballot you ask for, you are declaring yourself as a member of the party. Uh, in New Hampshire, uh, we have the opportunity to actually uh, remove your affiliation almost immediately. After you cast your ballot, there will be a station at each one of the wards where you can go and have your declaration removed. Uh, and it is a running list of names on the checklist with a line for a signature saying you want to return back to undeclared. A lot of people certainly take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and for those folks who register on election day, again, if you register as a Democrat, you'll only be assigned that Democratic ballot. But again, if you register as undeclared, we're going to give you sort of a little passport so that we can always <laughs> see visually that, oh, yes, you, you registered as undeclared when you started the day. And for those folks, uh, obviously, you're not going to be on this long list, but we will have little sort of what we call change back cards available at that, at that station. Now, some people sort of forget what party they're affiliated <laughs> with. Uh, that's something that cannot be resolved at the polling place with those officials. They will not have the extent of the record to go back through and look at your participation in various elections. So those queries where a voter says, I'm really, I've never voted a, a Democrat. Um, I don't mm -hmm. understand why I'm on a Democrat on this checklist. Uh, those calls should be directed through to my office through either the checklist supervisor or the ward moderator. Now what's gonna happen when we get the call? We're going to uh, not really look at the database. We're going to look at what we call a source document. Yep. So we're going to trace you back through. So we have those marked checklists from every, every election backwards. And we will trace you to see, ah, did you vote absentee in that election? That's usually what catches them, is they voted absentee, absentee. they weren't at the polling place, and they didn't easily yeah. switch back. But we'll be able to figure that out. Occasionally, there is, there's a clerical error on our part, but for the most part, uh, it may be a surprise, but it generally is accurate. <clears throat> and so again, like when you're talking absentee, so if I'm undeclared, if I'm going to ask for an absentee ballot, I mm -hmm. have to declare one way or another to get that certain absentee ballot. That's correct. And so again, so I fill out that absentee ballot, get notarized, send, send it in, then I have to personally take it upon myself to go and undeclare myself again. That's correct. That's correct. Though we don't require a notary on our absentee ballot, unlike most states. So it's a very simple process, but you've got to take the initiative to come back in. And so <clears throat> after the primary, so if I go in and I vote and I say, okay, I'm undeclared, I want to take a, a Republican ballot, mm -hmm. which I think there may be, I don't know, but maybe in in a non-contestant one where, say, the Democrats don't have any contested Republican, mm -hmm. so people may say, well, I want to vote in the right. Republican one. Mm -hmm. And if I forget to change, will there be um, another time frame for me to change later? Or do sure. It? Yep. Uh, always about 90 days before any party election. 90 days is generally the threshold. Uh, we will put in a notice in the newspaper and call the checklist supervisors into session and say it's time to, you know, here we're approaching the deadline to change your party affiliation. It will, it will come upon us quickly. It always does. Um, and I would think that it could well be or that June 2nd because that will be the filing period. And generally before a filing period, everybody gets locked down to their party choice. And, um, excuse me. We were, like, we were talking earlier about how this presidential campaign primary is, is really so unlike the last couple because, mm -hmm. and as we were talking before we came in, I was reading in the paper, because of all these Republican primaries, it seems like for New Hampshire and Iowa, it's about 75 to 80 percent less spending going on because they're getting it free on the debates. Oh, yes, it free nationally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in going back, it just seems strange. So you were talking about Romney's people, right? So in the past, you had all these different organizations that would come in, it, be proactive. Definitely, you know, the state law does allow a, a political campaign, a candidate on a political campaign, to get an absentee ballot list. 
that is generally confidential information, except the law did carve out opportunities for campaigns. Uh, it's been our practice in the past that almost all of our national campaigns by this point have contacted the office, and they've all been put on a schedule. Now, if they had their choice, they'd be in the office every other day getting the latest on the absentee ballots. Uh, we, as a practical matter, just trying to control the number of requests, uh, we take that sort of first request and then sort of put you on a cycle so that every Monday you're going to get a you're going to get a supplemental absentee ballot list to the preceding one, and at this point it was just the Romney campaign just this morning uh, was our first national campaign to approach us. They indicated they would take today's list. They'll be back next week, and that will be the extent of what they're going to attempt to do with absentee ballots in terms of contacting individuals. So, not at all what we've experienced <laughs> in the past. The um, <clears throat> When we're talking absentee ballots and we're talking college students, mm -hmm. the do we have a number of college students from, for example, Keene residents who who go out to colleges around the country ask for absentee ballots for Keene? You know, I think we do because we've always had a very um, standard practice with the, with the high school that we actually go to the graduating class every year. And we register those class, to those those graduating seniors, and we actually provide them the information to obtain absentee ballots. So, for our graduating classes, they get into the habit of asking for the absentee back ballot back from their home place. So, uh, I think because of that outreach that has been very standard for the last five or six years, we do have a lot of Keene State, I mean, a lot of Keene High School students who actually vote absentee with us. Yeah, because we have an awful lot of kids who graduate from Keene High and go out of state. That's right. And it'd be kind of a waste for them, for them to lose their opportunity to vote. Right. And they also get to participate in the school elections. So another advantageous uh, decision to keep it, keep it local. The, um, as, as, you, as you're coming up, do you, you see any po potential problems? Do you see... The different groups, because I've seen in the past different ones mm. bringing in their lawyers and oh, stuff and yes. kind of just hanging over their intimidation or any yeah. intimidation. Yeah, you know, I think I'm hoping that we have settled the issue of student voting <laughs> in this community uh, because in uh, at the last presidential, it, it was, we probably had it at points more lawyers at the polling place than we had election officials. I mean, really scrutinizing every everything that could be scrutinized. That really does make for a challenged environment in terms of just the work, the sort of the, the flow of voters. I mean, that is very probably the most critical thing for us is to keep voters in and out as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. Because there's one thing that will deter a voter, is that when Wait you drive up to the polling place and you see no parking place, that's the worst thing. And so we really have a mindset to bring them in and send them through the process and send them on their way as quickly as possible. So when you have these attorneys challenging everything and citing statutes that, uh, I mean, sometimes their knowledge and their citation of a, of a state law is probably a little bit more efficient proficient than many of our election officials just because they've gone through and looked through that stuff with a fine-tooth comb looking for sort of the the subtleties and election laws that uh, are sort of the most of us don't really need to have that level of, of knowledge in terms of what are the what are the things we can nitpick and challenge a voter's right to exercise their right to vote that's not the mindset that we have we feel that all people should be exercising their right and and finding reasons to deny that is not really the mindset that we come in with it, it, some people like to intimidate people out of voting if mm -hmm. if i show up and i register and is any question about me do I have the opportunity to vote? And if so, what happens to that vote while the question's still out there? Sure. There's a, there's a challenge of, the, of, the, of a voter's right. And essentially what it does is it, it, puts, uh, sort of, it puts on notice what the challenge is all about. The person who's making the challenge has to fill out a, a form explaining the reasons why maybe they don't believe that the person is entitled, is, by domicile reason, is not entitled to vote. Uh, then there is a sort of a ruling by the moderator. Often, if it's a domicile issue, it will be the input from the checklist supervisors as to the domicile of the person within the ward. Uh, 
But then what it happens is the moderator will make a decision. Is that challenge uh, have reasonable grounds or does it not? And so I would say generally speaking, I've never had a challenge actually result in a ballot being uh, not processed. It is almost sort of just a pause, let's ascertain, the moderator views the evidence, makes a decision, and, and uh, again, I've never seen a challenge result in someone's vote being denied. Two things, because of the economy. We have a heck of a lot more homeless people. Mm -hmm. So if I'm living in a homeless shelter, I'm living in my car, if mm -hmm. I'm living under a bridge, or if I'm mm -hmm. living over in Mr. Timmy Robinson's where a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, mm -hmm. do I lose my right to vote? Definitely not. What we want to do is ascertain where are you because the city of Keene is broken up into five sort of voting districts. We call them wards. They sort of radiate out from the center, the central square area. So we're just going to want to identify approximately where are you at? Are you behind the Hannaford's uh, Plaza? Or are you uh, under the Stone Arch Bridge? Because those are two different voting places. And we will, that's the only objective is to ascertain that you are correctly domiciled in that ward. And then again, uh, your identity. And if you did not have a, any identification, there's the affidavit that you say who you are. And there's no requirement. So if if I live at 58 Grove Street, mm -hmm. and on January 6th or January 9th, I move to Elm Street, that means I vote in the new ward. There's no, re I don't go and vote in the old, no, no ward. I, right. It is where your you, domicile is. On the day of the election. On the day of the election. Uh, so we will treat you, you know, each of these wards in our mind are, are towns. So the new, your new town, <laughs> Uh, you should go to register and vote on election day in that town. And as you register, we're going to say, were you previously registered? You're going to say, ah, 58 Grove Street. So we'll, at that point, remove you off of that checklist. The, um, <clears throat> the other one, handicapped people, disabled people. Mm -hmm. What do we do for, to accommodate disabled people? Or what do we do for um, the elderly uh, who are homebound? Sure. We do a few things. One, we're, my office is very engaged, uh, and in fact, today we're visiting two of our uh, nursing home facilities. So the office hits all of, uh, for national elections. We go to all the major nursing homes, and we go to all of the key housing authority complexes and actually do the uh, registration process. We'll take along a checklist supervisor, one or two folks from my office, actually facilitate registrations and absentee ballots. So we do that for sort of the elderly population. Uh, in terms of uh, disabilities, uh, absentee ballots, that is one of the qualifiers for getting an absentee <coughs> ballot. So we certainly have a component of the population that just routinely asks for an absentee ballot. If you choose to vote on election day at a polling place, and we certainly mm. would encourage that, um, we have um, a seating of, and sort of screens so that you can actually sit down uh, if your disability is you can't stand for long periods of time. So there's sort of voting screens where you can just sit down at a table with some privacy and cast a ballot. If your disability is, is more than that, for state elections there is the um, a assisted voting system that uses a, um, I call it a sip and puff, where you sort of just gulp to indicate choices, yes and no. And it's a connection. Um, over a phone line where someone is reading a ballot to you and you are making your choices by a gulping um, mechanism in your throat and that is uh, indicating how your choices on this ballot. It's actually marked uh, by your choices and then it results in a paper ballot being printed uh, and then that paper ballot is hand, count, uh, hand counted at the end of the night. So, so someone who is visually, dis visually disabled or, or blind Mm -hmm. That's a mechanism of allowing sure. them to vote. And one other thing that we do for uh, someone who is blind is the state law does allow you to request that someone accompany you into the polling uh, booth itself. Uh, generally, that's a family member. The state law does restrict it that it cannot be an employer or a union rep. Which makes a lot of sense. Yes. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> Again, as, as we're, we're getting <clears throat> older, 
for example, some things with, with dementia and Alzheimer's, is, does that have an effect on my ability to vote? Or that may be a tough one for... Um, mm, you know, that is a very to, difficult to, because we certainly have had... Judge. Exactly. We certainly have had some election officials that have been a, a bit concerned, but it is not up to us to say that a voter does not have the mental faculty to, to actually go into the polling place. So that's so they can go in the polling place by themselves. Oh, definitely. But not it then would it would raise a level of concern if I go and say my father-in-law, my grandfather is has Alzheimer's dementia, so I'm going to go in and vote with him. Generally, people aren't that clear as to what the issue is. Yeah. It's, it's usually an observation from the election <clears throat> official that the the voter does not have a sense of what's really happening. But again, I have never had an election official ever try to intercept that process. In, in, in cases you're going to the nursing homes and stuff like that, then you can have a doctor or a medical person help you out on that. Yeah, all of those arrangements with the nursing homes are done through their staff. So we have actually trained professionals that are sort of assisting us with the process. So as we get ready to wrap it up, how do you think it's going to go? What do you think the turnout's going to be, or do you think there's going to be any problems? You know, every election uh, has issues <laughs> in terms of just the logistics of the process. It is far more complicated than it was every year, every other four years. It becomes more and more complicated with federal regulations that we need to sort of keep in mind as we do the process. Uh, but we have a great staff of election officials. We're actually all going through the <laughs> Secretary of State's online training modules. Uh, so we're all really just coming up to speed with any sort of law changes that have happened over the last year. And so we're looking for a great election. We're looking for a good turnout. Uh, we do think that voters realize that New Hampshire has a place in history, and they're going to take it seriously, and they're going to come out and vote. And so we're talking about the, one of the changes with the state. So the next keen election will no longer be first person who signs up gets the top of the ballot? That's one of the <laughs> charter changes is that we're actually going to adopt what's called the seed number from the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Gardner. Uh, picks a letter out of a, a number out of the hat that corresponds to a letter to the alphabet and that sets the sort of the th those candidates for the next two years starting with that l last name are actually first on the ballot and we start going alphabetical from there so we will be moving away from the uh, park outside the city <laughs> clerk's office at 4 a.m. to get your name on the ballot first <laughs> so <clears throat> I want to thank you and thank you. See, it went pretty um, quick. No trick questions. No. <laughs> and I think you, you passed the wealth, your wealth of knowledge. Oh, it's well, gonna, thank and it's you. going to help a, a, a lot of people. Well, thank you. And is Keene State going to be out? They're not going to be in session. They're they come back to Keene the week after. So that will definitely the, provide a different dynamics. Probably keep a lot less lawyers here. Yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> and Marriott may not like it because they won't be able to, you know, lawyers, yeah, right. <laughs> lawyers like to have those high places. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity to I come. Wanna, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Good luck at the election. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's always nice to talk to Patty. She has a, a wealth of knowledge and Keene as well as New Hampshire. We really pride on being the first primary in the nation. And we need a first primary in the nation you got to get it right. There's no room for, for errors. And Patty's an expert on it. And you'll see her on um, primary day running from ward to ward to ward to ensure that everything is done correctly. And so <clears throat> if anybody has any questions about where they should vote, how they're going to vote, just give the city clerk's office and they'll get you in the, um, the right direction and at the right polling station. <clears throat> and so... Today, we'll move on. I went out, I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, to December, today's December 12th, went out to 200 Summit Road. Today was the first official day of the new Keene YMCA. And I was quite surprised that at 5 a.m. there was quite a few people out there. It was, I would say, about 70% of the, um, the equipment was being used. They have some new um, equipment. They have equipment out in, in the hallways. They're making maximum use of the, um, the area. <clears throat> Saw some people out there on the indoor running track. There was actual people swimming. Five o'clock in the morning, Keene, New Hampshire, 17 degrees. 
and people were, were swimming. Um, the Keen Y, it's gone a long way. It took a long time. There's no doubt they still have some more work to do to get it tip-top shape, but it's functioning, and the people were out there this morning um, were enjoying it. And so what I've got is a small clip, maybe about eight minutes, of just giving you an idea of what the new Y looks like, and the people were there. One of the people, one of the things that <clears throat> the people at the old Y used to complain about was that one flat screen TV, and it was always ESPN. Well, the new weight room you'll see, the um, exercise room has six of them, and they all have different stations on. <clears throat> and so I hope you enjoy the um, clip, and I'll be right back once the clip is over. So thank you. Okay, I'm here at the new Y on 200 Summit Road. I'm here with Josh. What is your position with the Y? Uh, associate Director. Um, here we are at the uh, new wellness center at our facility on 200 Summit Road. Um, day one of, of facility operation. Uh, been a great morning so far. It's a little after 5 a.m., uh, 5.15, I think, and uh, we've got about 30 people in our fitness center, which has been a great surprise. You can look behind me. There's about 28 people in here working uh, right you, now. You, you come on to uh, <laughs> steady flow most of the morning. Uh, about 14 members out front of the doors prior to 5 o'clock to get into the new facility. So, so far, day one seems to be a great success. And did you, you ever expect this amount of people on, on day one? Uh, we expect, yeah. I think we were hoping we'd get more people than we have at 38 Roxbury Street. Um, didn't really know exactly how many people, but uh, this is a great turnout. And um, it seems like when I was driving up here this morning, traffic is really light. It's a nice, quick ride. Absolutely. Uh, my, my ride working into work today was a very clean drive. No lights on West Street. So I'm going to probably come to work every day at 5 minutes. Because it took me but less than 10 minutes from down by the post office to get here. And on sometimes in the morning, it used to take me 5 to 10 minutes at Roxbury just to get to Roxbury Street, find a parking spot. Yeah, so absolutely. travel time is not much of a difference. So plenty of parking here uh, and a lot more room for more people to come on down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Okay. So no dust bunnies. No dust bunnies. A little nervous that there's not only eight of us in here. If I'm not early morning, usually one of the only women. So a little frightened, but I have to share my men happily married. A pool that is not disgusting. I know it's been kept clean for years, but it has six swings and a real length. Let's see what else. Cleanliness. Did I mention the cleanliness? The lights, the brightness. Because one of the things I seem to notice. The old oh. Y, it was freezing. It used well, to freeze. Well, this is a little too hot, so we'll have to get that. But the indoor track, um, not so excited about the commute. Live on Jordan Road. <laughs> that took me like eight minutes to get here, and I was speeding. Let's see what else. <gasps> Peter Wellnack, I'm excited about Peter Wellnack. <laughs> yeah. um, but more classes. More classes? I can't, like, what else? I mean, the pool. Let's see. Hey, it's it. That's what I got. So you really enjoyed yourself? Yes, yeah. so far. So far, so good. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure, hex beat running outside. <laughs> Yeah. 
day one at the Keene YMCA new pool here on 200 Summit Road. Without doubt, this has to be the best pool in the Keene area. Got the Whirlpool. We got the handicap accessible smaller pool. <clears throat> there it is, 5.30, people swimming. course is a little he hectic. Pretty realistic course. One of the new interactive um, cyclist machine here at the Keen Wine. Handlebars move. Get wiped out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like um, being in a flight simulator. What do you think of these new machines? Pretty nice, huh? No moving all the weights around, seems pretty safe. You guys made sure you used all the space. Oh yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have stations in the corners. Well, hope you enjoyed the clip, and I hope it motivates you to go out there and take um, a look at the Y. I think you'll enjoy it, especially on some of those nice cold days. Maybe it's zero and you want to go and exercise. Perfect place to go. Hey, if you um, want to feel guilty, you want to keep your wife happy, and she says, get off your butt and you need to exercise, hey, you can go to the Y, stair climber or the, um, the rowing machine, and you can still watch the New England Patriots while you're exercising. You know what? Keep her happy, get in shape, keep your doctor happy, and help Keen get to be one of the healthiest communities in the country by 2020. Okay. Now let's go to um, my little clipboard. <clears throat> I've been listening to a lot of the, um, the politicians. I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican. And over and over and over again, they kept talking about how we're going to address the deficit, deficit. And they're going back and forth. Don't want to raise taxes. Don't want to make cuts. Going back and forth, back and forth. And <clears throat> I'm getting letter after letter, email with TV ads saying, 
you know, we, we can't cut this. We can't cut veterans benefits. We'll violate a promise. We can't cut education because without a high quality education, you can't have a highly function democracy. Without a high quality education, you don't have a middle class. You can't cut the <clears throat> funding to the, the mentally disabled. You can't cut the funding to the military because we could be destroyed by Al Qaeda. And, it goes on and on and on, and people keep saying can't, can't, can't. And as we keep going and saying can't, 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 the problem is getting worse and worse and worse. And it's kind of like, where is the leadership? Where is the people are going to step up? Where is, it's kind of like being, the, like I said before, being a parent. Who's going to go and say, this is what we have to do if we want to ensure that we have a good future, a positive future. Every time we keep saying can't, we dig ourselves deeper and deeper in a hole. Plain and simple is, yes, it's going to be tough. We've got to work together. But how do we go and do it to solve the problem? And I was kind of thinking maybe is the old um, little thing. You had two five-year-old boys arguing over... Um, a candy bar, you know what, we have to share, and um, well, I don't want to share, he's going to share, it's not going to be fair, it's going back and forth, he's going to get the bigger piece, the whole works. So I says, you know what, maybe let's have one person, one of the five-year-olds, break the, the, um, the candy bar in half. If they break the candy bar, the, whoever breaks the candy bar in half gets the last piece. So... And it's kind of. So we get the revenue of $2.4 trillion. We have expenditures of $3.6 trillion. And so we have a deficit of $1.2 trillion. We're going on and on and on and saying we can't. Right now, we have a debt, a debt, our credit card, $15 trillion on our credit card. And we're saying we can't, we can't, we can't. Well... It, no, no, we have to stop saying we can't. We're going to have to not only say we're going to, we have to, we have to. We have to find a will to solve the problem. So if we had one group were saying, well, we've got to keep increasing taxes, we've got to increase revenues, plain and simple, we have to do that. So maybe if we're a five-year-old kid, go and says, Okay, I will increase revenues by $600 billion. So if I cre increase revenues by $600 billion next year, allowing us to spend, um, bringing in $3.3 trillion, but we keep the expenditures the same at $3.6 trillion. So if we're going to increase revenue by $600 billion, then... Why not allow the Tea Party and the, um, the Republicans or the fiscal conservatives them to come up with $6 trillion, I mean $600 billion. They come up to pick what is the, the, how are they going to cut $600 billion out of it. And <clears throat> all we go, hey, plain and simple, we're going to decrease expenditures by $600 um, billion dollars. So the Tea Party and ultra-conservatives, Glover Norkrich wants to decrease um, spending by um, $600 billion, make a smaller government, then lets the people on the, the Democrats or the people who <clears throat> are social and they're saying, hey, a government has a certain responsibility, let them decide how they're going to do away with it. Maybe they go and say, you know what? We're going to do away with $600 billion worth of um, corporate welfare. Maybe McDonald's doesn't get a um, couple of bit million dollars a year in the tax credit to, so they can sell chicken nuggets in China or in India. Maybe um, the farmers in um, Iowa get billions of dollars <clears throat> so they can um, take corn and grow, turn it into ethanol, which increases the, um, the cost of food. And, and so, you know what? We, it works with little kids, and it's, it's amazing how I can get a five- or six-year-old kid, two of them work together, and they can get there and say, okay, 
If you break the, you cut it in half, I get to pick the piece first. We We don't have that. We just don't have that. And even this, plain and simple, if we went in and said, hey, this is what we have right now. Even if we went right now and we didn't do anything, if we didn't increase anything, we didn't increase or decrease, or we went and said, for the next 10 years, we will not, all we're going to do is keep 2.4 trillion in revenue and we're going to keep spending 6.3 trillion. Okay, we're not going to change a single thing. So that means we 2021, we will have $27 trillion in debt. Okay, but if we don't do anything, this will automatically cut spending because what we're going to do is we're going to double the amount of money that we spend every year just on interest payments. And so, plain and simple is if we're going to keep the debt at 1.2 trillion deficit, 1.2 trillion dollars a year, cost of living increases will go up. You may say, okay, we can't afford any cost, any more cost of living increases. You may say we can't spend a single penny extra for defense. Plain and simple, we, that level stays the same. Or uh, we can't spend any more in Medicare. Won't go, can't do that. Will not put allow any more people on Social Security disability. We tighten up the standards. Or we go and say, excuse me, we're not going to um, give a bunch of corporate welfare tax breaks or loopholes. Plain and simple, you can't do that because the mandatory interest payment is going to go up every single year. And every year it goes up, it reduces the amount of money that we are going to be able to spend on the economy and, and on government services. So doing nothing, locking in this, just being brutal and locking in this number will reduce the size of government, will mean that the American taxpayers will probably spend by the... T- 10 years out, we'll probably spend about, over the course of those 10 years, maybe about two and a half to three trillion dollars extra just in interest payments. That's for doing nothing, just locking it in. And so those interest payments will have to be able to come out of these expenditures. You are, the expenditures are going to be locked in. You're just going to have to prioritize what you want. But the way the law goes, interest has to be paid, plain and simple, or unless someone's going to go and say, you know what, we have over 100% of our debt. Our debt is so big, it's more than we make in every year. We produce as a country every year. And so when that happens, if I'm a business, I go bankrupt. Plain and simple, if we don't do anything, we're on the way to bankrupting the country. And I don't want my country to be bankrupt. And I want people to pay their fair share. I want everyone to contribute to the best of their ability. And I want leaders who are going to say to me, that's what we need to do. Everybody has to pay a little bit more, and everybody has to get get a little some little less. Otherwise, we're all going to get a heck of a lot less, and that's that's the, the frustrating part. And Tuesday night, tomorrow night at the Keene High, you're going to at the Keene Board of Education, you're going to hear things concerning. <clears throat> closing a school, block scheduling, and whether you like it or not, all those are being driven by the fact we don't have any more money to pay what we would like to provide. And so if we don't do something soon, we're stuck. The money is going to tell us what we can do, not what we can do with the money we have. The money is going to say, you can no longer do this because you don't have any money. That has to stop.
So another one, just food for thought. And so to a lighter side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up with about a three minute clip. It's going to be jumpy, but it's going to be, as anybody who goes to the Cheshire Fair, the pig chase. And so I hope you have fun with the pig chase. And again, if I don't see you and you don't watch the show after this one, have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday season. Thank you. Supposed to help. Oh. 